um, maybe some of those motivations mm -hmm. or some of the outcomes that you found working that way? Well, I feel like we need, um, as I identify as a lesbian artist, as a lesbian artist, I felt like there was no foundation and I needed to find it. So that's the reason, the impetus. And to give to all of us who are interested in that, uh, that's the interest in my historical films on um, Claude Cahoon, Alice Austin, um, Elizabeth Bishop, um, bringing all these women who had more reasons to hide than I did. Um, out of the closet so they could be the ground that we walk on to know that there were lesbian artists and queer artists building um, uh, work that was relevant to us. Maybe we just needed to go a little deeper to see it, go around a corner, ask a different kind of a question. So then, with age, I want to give back. So. Finding Gina Carducci working in a film lab. She hadn't made a film for five years. I looked at her film, it was terrific. What? We're losing. We're losing a queer filmmaker right here. So I thought, let's do something together. And my motivation also was a bit selfish. She's working in the lab, we get all the lab free. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> We're looking for ourselves while we give, right? <laughs> So we had a, you know, an intense year of making Generations, which did very well, and we have two different personalities in it. When I saw, you know, that mentorship sometimes would keep somebody from developing because they look up to you too much, uh -huh. I said, let's go edit separately. So we shot together, and then we left each other for six months, coming back with 14 minutes and 30 seconds each. And then we wedded by passing <laughs> the, film, <laughs> the film course through each other's fingers. And <laughs> you don't need to know the details. <laughs> just, just laughing at and remembering. And then we looked at the footage, and Gina's is so beautiful and abstract and all about film. And mine is so intense and about relationship. I mean, I think there are two of us in every image, you know, and hers, you hardly see a person, you know. <laughs> So we definitely put the abstract first, because, you know, we had to have a punch at the end. So Generations 30 Minutes, and then I just started a new project, and if any of you are interested in it, please let me know. It's called The Living Archive. I started it at a residency upstate New York, and I took in my flatbed into uh, a space and all my outtakes from my films. And then I would pull something out and we'd put on the flat. Oh, that was a Halloween parade I shot in the village in 1983. Who wants it? Somebody wanted it. Okay, and then I have, oh, this is a man in a hospital with um, um, a ventilator. Anybody want that, black and white? Somebody wanted it. So each of the six people there took one or two rolls of film and they either digitized it or they scratched and painted. They re-edited, and they made their own films. So they retitled it, but they would say what films from mine came from, and we then had a screening at the end of the month. Um, so I have about 15 boxes of outtakes. <laughs> they're, they're really quite beautiful, like the um, piece about the hospital and the parade. You have a man in a hospital bed, and then suddenly you have this ghoulish figure in costume coming up to the edge of the bed. You know, and then some text coming on. So it's back and forth between the ghosts visiting this poor guy. Um, and everybody did. Somebody took a roll of film, and she, she used her uh, iPhone like this, vertically, and she rolled it out at a lake, Lake Minnewasco, which has huge cliffs, and then the, the film goes over, and then you see her walking, and then ends with this flash. So sort of like a conceptual piece. So all these went together. And so if any of you who know my work, or even want to go to the website and look at little snippets of the work and want to have some footage and make a film from it, let me know which film it is you want. And then I will, in the ensuing spring, as all my health returns, find that footage and get it to you. And then we'll have a screening and get it all together again. Um, so that's another generational, you know, I don't care, you could be my age and still do it. So it doesn't, 
you know, no restrictions there. But I think it's, it's really um, important and exciting and wonderful to work with peoples of all preferences, all generations, all, I mean, too often we're in our own little safe world, aren't we, of people just like us. So, I um, delight in meeting difference. You know, Barbara, your work is so critically important. And sometimes you walk away from it. You know, and I just want to say, as a gay man, your work in the 70s was extraordinary. And it was specific. And I can remember being in a room full of women, watching all of them for the first time, that mirror film, and feeling like a spy on the wall. <coughs> But the excitement that was you could feel in the room, the sense of discovery that your work brought to them. My question is, at a certain point, I think late 90s, early 2000s, your work really fundamentally changed from being sort of political, uh, body-centric work to using new forms of expression, new techniques, new, and I want to know how you made that transition and why you sometimes walked away from that fantastic body of work that you had done previously. Okay, I have to, to answer this, I have to put on my dark jacket. <laughs> 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 okay, Jim. I never, I never really walked away. And if I could rap, I would, because I'm going to tell you that I'm just as strong and good as I would be in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and the aughts. I'm right here, and I am hot. <laughs> no, you know, Picasso went through many stages in his work. You know, and now we're only discovering his sculptures. You know... An artist grows and develops and changes. I don't, you know, to do celebratory work of what it was like to come out in the 70s when we were undressing, being radical, but finding each other for the first time. I had been a heterosexual woman for nine years. I mean, my world burst, and with the world came of the films. But to move into the 80s and repeat the 70s is much more interesting for me to look at what were other people talking about in film. They were talking about structuralism and minimalism. Okay, I confronted that too. Mm -hmm. Not with my body out front, but with my body behind the camera. And so I walked across the United States, taking one frame of film for every step in bed time. I swam underwater and went over a waterfall into the ocean where I lost my camera in the sand in Pond and Waterfall. So, I was bringing heart and emotion and feeling into structural film. I was talking about a dialogue with a larger group of people than the lesbian community. In the 90s, I returned to politics with Nitrate Kisses mm -hmm. and the two features that follow that. It's part of you as an artist or part of the milieu. I mean, I can't imagine I have one of Carrie Moyer's early paintings. I'm so lucky for he gave it to me as a present. And I love, I look at it every day. And I love it. You know, and I wonder what other works in that series, or if there were a series that she might have made, I don't really know. And, you know, I guess I would be happy if she went on just doing that painting. But she wouldn't be. She's gone on to explore board paint, sparkles on paint, walls, or patterns. You know what I mean? How can we can't satisfy ourselves by repeating the same poem over and over as a poet? You know? So I mean I feel blessed that I've been able to change and make the work and be supported by the Arts Council and the people that have given me money. But I am so happy that I made those films in the 70s. I stand behind them any day of the week and I'm thrilled to see that they're revived today you know, and what they mean to a queer community today, to see the celebrations, like menstruating on a hill above the University of California. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Can you imagine? Come on, girls. Get out of there, take off your clothes, you know, and put a hard-boiled egg between your legs. And when I say
say three, open, <laughs> let it fall, and pour the dragon blood on it. <laughs> That's the crazy stuff we were doing, you know. I just saw it the other day, too. I mean, it's, it is, it's interesting because it's so relevant, you know, and, uh, and sometimes I feel like, uh, um, oh, well, you know, mix. You know, maybe it's dated or this or that, but I, I have to say those those films from the seventies, they just scream we just scream yeah, on that yeah, night. You know? Yeah. Every single day we had a program that included at least one. That's what I heard. Yeah. yeah, we saw Menses and we saw we saw Multiple Orgasm. Yeah, Dac Tactics, um Nitro Kisses. Yeah, Nitro Kisses, yeah. Yeah. And the two sisters. That that film, that that Sisters. Yes. Yeah, gotta get sisters on D V D. Well, there may be, you know, um, I will be having a major event here at the museum. And you! <laughs> as it grows and expands, and um, one of the things, one of the, the film curators looking at work that isn't out of the closet, <laughs> and Sisters is one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh boy, this is exciting. <laughs> I was wondering, if, I was curious about your relationship to sound and film over the years. And you talked a lot about touch, and I feel like you talk also a lot about space. Yeah. But I wanted to ask about your relationship to sound in your films and how that's changed over the years. Mm -hmm. Well, it's become much more complex, and I've been much more involved in sound editing and composition and design. Did you see uh, the Bishop film, Welcome to This House? Have no, you seen it yet? No, yeah. no, no. Um, so with that film, and with the Meredith Monk film, the film about my cancer, um, A Horse is Not a Metaphor? That is Okay, both of those major artists, Joan LaBarbera with my Bishop film, and um, Meredith Monk with A Horse, gave me permission to use their CDs. And I was then able to do the crafting of the editing of the sound with the image. Um, and people don't really know that because you don't write sound composition, you write sound by merit. Oh, you know. Um, but I think I have a talent there. <laughs> I want you to see the Bishop film and see what you think on that. Because I like the female voice as an instrument. And that's the way I'm using both of them in both of those two films. And Pamela Z in Love Her Other. She composed the score though. That was a different arrangement. But early on, I just uh, I, didn't, I kind of ignored sound. Well, with Dark Tactics, Mills Where did that sound come from? Yeah, at the Moog Synthesizer. Mills College has this experimental sound you know, the mold you patch it and it can make all these sounds. So they didn't let me play in it for a day. They took me oh, in so there you in the morning. Composed that. I composed it. Oh, yeah. cool. It's still, it always sticks in my head. It's, it's still running through my head for the mix. You can't hear it. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> great. I'll be honest. Yeah. So it makes me feel good. The oh, sound. good. Yes. Um, what was your most successful off the wall film? And do you find that it was successful in generating activity after the performance? Because uh -huh. I, I was very clued into your comment about voting. Oh, good. Good. I'm glad to get that feedback because yeah. you know, I, I that's it. part of being active right there. <laughs> um, you know, people, I love it when they have to run through. I'm going like this with the projector, you know, running through the audience. You know? I'm projecting on the floor, I'm projecting on the ceiling, and they're having to keep up. Yeah. But we never did an inventory at the door, a questionnaire. You know, <laughs> um, how are you feeling? Are you more active now? Are you going to? <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. It's just like in teaching. You really don't know your results. You don't know how much you've influenced somebody. You know, I mean, that's what they say. But those, like, they triggered more audience participation, obviously, during the performance. Yep. And did you feel that, like, it was a better, like, energy in the room? Like, yeah? It, yeah? Well, people hadn't seen anything like that. Right. And I could select where I was projecting, like, Jeu de Bon. I projected a moon coming out from the rising in the sky into the projection booth itself. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was very cool. <laughs> you know, and you could project yeah. on the chairs. 
Right. And people would have to get up to see it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> In fact, there I was working with Rosa Barba and we covered the chairs with paper. Yeah. So we could they could not sit down. The audience could never sit because we were in a traditional theater. And we combined, she was having a show there and I was having a show. So we did the performance together. And it, but it was all about cutting through, we cut through the screen together and jumped into the audience holding hands. Now one time at the tape, I had my knife and I flipped out my hands. Oh my gosh. It was awesome. You know that turbine ball. <laughs> Luckily it was on the floor. <laughs> So I could have had a, some story to tell you, it wouldn't be good. I also wanted to ask about um, your participation in the 1993 Whitney Biennial. Like, can you explain like your experience? Was it a positive one? That was the that was a good biennial. Yeah, it was because fantastic. That was a fantastic. Were you there? No, I wasn't. I was like alive but barely. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally there in spirit, though. <laughs> there were white hairs in the audience. I mean, in the group. There were white hair artists. There were artists of color. There were feminist artists. There were queer artists. You know, there's a ton of queer artists in our biennial we just had as well. And we felt recognized. We felt part, finally, of this mm -hmm. mythical art world right. that we tried to be part of. We had been knocking on the door. It was a time of, it was of the political plan, you know, and it hasn't been repeated. Yeah, that's also, yeah. like, and I, this is, you're the only artist I've ever had the opportunity to ever converse with who, who was shown there. So I had to ask you about it. Well, you might want to email Martha Rossler. Oh, I love her. I saw her at, uh, of course you the, did. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Sale at MoMA. Oh, yeah. I went like three days in a row, and people were like, Why are you just sitting in this thing? I'm just like, Because it's cool. It's better like, than Marina Ramage. <laughs> 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 like, yeah. So, cool. yeah. Yeah, that was a great buy. Yeah. Uh, what a lovely audience you are. Okay, anybody else besides Jim? Because we know he's going to like to pin me. I did. I mean, the painting of Nixon 
There's three Nixon paintings on the pieces of paper, about four by five feet. And one of these pulling out his dick, and it's called Dirty Dick. You know? <laughs> and another one, he's got a hand up, and all there is is a toilet roll. The end of the toilet roll of cardboard. Um, so there's anger. There's politics that still continue today. I'm proud of it. So the last question is going here. Carrie. I just, I mean, it's kind of an observation, but I'm hoping you can sort of expand on it, it which is that, you know, part of the suppression of gay art or queer art has been economic. You know, it's like, who can afford to be an artist? How do we make art? And that's one thing that I feel you've been really able to figure out, yeah. and I admire that a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just modeling that mm -hmm. for other women artists or other queer artists mm -hmm. is, like, so important. Mm -hmm. You know, to be a full-time artist is so different than doing it, you know. Weekends. Yeah. Yeah, when you're tired after right. teaching for another job. Very difficult. What do you want me to do? <laughs> to talk about I mean, that. I guess thinking like, I mean, part of it is sort of having the courage to just say like, okay, this is what yeah. I want. Yeah, what do you want in life? You know, yeah. do you want that house? You know, right. I, no, I didn't. Did I want a car? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Did I want to do the work? Yes. Did I want to teach? Yes. Mm -hmm. But I was a lesbian at the wrong time. I think you can be hired now as a lesbian, but I had radical lesbian feminists written by my name on the blackboard when I applied from one, this is one school I know about, where I had a friend on the hiring committee who told me, you know, they didn't write, you know, conservative Republican by anybody <laughs> or any other kind of adjective. So I couldn't get hired in teaching, which sort of cut my, you know, resources down. I was lucky to get into West Bath which is, you know, subsidized rent, hardly anything. And I was able to sublet for seven years until I got and sleep on couches, until I got into West Bath. Right. And, you know, I mean, I think you can make your work out of anything. I mean, really, I think you can make it on the street, for sure, to try this, you know, perception. Um, and, and with people, social engagement. Uh, so, but I have been fortunate to be with lovers who would probably, I would say, support me in some way or another. I mean, besides emotionally. Um, and Maybe your mother's uh, belief in you. I mean, I think there's yeah. some, so that's part of the... That's it. You know. I, would, I mean, I never really thought about waitressing or anything like that. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, my mother left me with $10,000. You know, now I'm doing my will, you know, and I think I should pass that on to people and leave chunks like that. Because that got me through grad school and got my MA. But what did I do? I lived in gay men's beautiful Victorian house basement without running water mm -hmm. and without a toilet. I peed into a coffee can mm -hmm. and I poured it out every day. And it's in the first, if you see I Was, I Am, my second film, 60 millimeter film, you can see it. Um, some of the surroundings there. Um, I really didn't care about capitalism and about which, I mean, no, you know, I want to get paid for my work, yes, that's always been sure I do. That's not a, um, so I guess I had a strategic plan before I knew what strategic planning was to have a one year goal, a three year goal, a five year goal, to write your obituary. <coughs> Years. 20 years before you die, because then you put out who you want to be when you reach the end of maturity. The These are all helpful processes I found later, but um, <clears throat> I mean, I married a, when I was hetero, I married a, a working class guy who taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would live in a pet hospital for free because he would do the janitorial work on the weekend. You know, we lived on a ranch, and I exercised a horse. I mean, there are so many ways to move through society without doing the usual, right. you know. 
I was thinking that too. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, it's just, it's just night and day when we see it in our students who mm -hmm. are struggling with oh. debt. They can't afford mm -hmm. rent in New York. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and how that's closing down options, possibilities. Yeah. 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 I have to say, though, the, um, the, the lesson I've always taken from it's a, it's a kind of major theme in your book as well. It's about resilience, you know, like I, and playfulness. Like I think you've always met challenges with a kind of humor um, and and sophistication uh, that that allow you to produce really like positivity in the world. Uh, so when I when I read your book, you know, when I see your films, uh, it's always radiant. Uh, with a kind of um, humorous possibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, last two questions. Yeah. Very quickly, um, in terms of being legitimated, and one of the reasons why I've looked up to you and like Martha Ross there is that during that 70s period, you were able to become legitimated, and that art is considered legitimate. Mm -hmm. um, so now we're talking very candidly about what makes LGBT art and the experience candid and legitimate. Now, I, I, a, a personal anecdote, I was showing my resume to an individual for um, prospective help, and this was just at a neighborhood bar, and I was told that I should uh, shorten the name of the establishment just because that it was seen as something radical, it was seen as something definitive. And I obviously didn't do that, I obviously didn't addendum, but I was, it was very interesting to me that how do you maintain that positivity when you have been legitimated for so long and people are continuing to kind of, re, you know, you do meet these challenges with such energy and such positivity, and I'm having a very hard time meeting those challenges in 2015 with the same style of positivity and expectation that this yeah, shouldn't think, even be happening anymore. Yeah, I think the, like Deborah mentioned, the times have changed, it's harder, but I think that the really world is fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Big, big, big time. Sorry. Big time. <laughs> but I, I don't think I were, I mean, as much as, you know, say I wanted to be legitimate, I mean, as much as there was that, but what really I cared about was the work. Right. Yeah. That was what kept me going. No. I get so much pleasure from creating, making something new, following, even if it's the weirdest thought that I have, trying it out. That is what nourishes me, and that's what all that work from the 70s, the paintings and stuff, were. And yeah. You know, it wasn't even ever, well. So, I mean, that's, I think this legitimate and this, you know, being accepted and all that, yes, it's wonderful, but, but you, you, you got to get your body of work yeah. behind you, and that's what you care about. Yeah, I was sort of around this, this, this same question. Um, multiple orgasms is as transgressive today as it was then. In fact, I think it's more so today because female sexuality um, made by women, not for men, is, is, has a very different feeling. And it's still seeing it mix and watching the, and feeling the audience very young, shocked. Because it, it hadn't been in their face, so to speak. But, but my question... <laughs> my question to... Female sexuality is monumental. Really? Yeah. But my question is that, that now that, that, that sapphic sexuality has been sort of mainstreamed in media and film... Um, Carol opens tomorrow. Um, the the blue film. The it, it's 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 very sophisticated and hip to to talk about you know lesbians and lesbian sexuality. How does that make you feel? I mean, well, I made multiple orgasm as a silent film. 
multiple orgasm was made so you could hear your neighbor breathing. <laughs> so far, no matter when it was shown, 1976 when it was made, or yesterday at Mix, everyone holds their breath still. <laughs> so, <laughs>